on the shore of the Sahara Desert, in a dry and desolate land. For the sake of love, a young cattle herder is about to make a punishing journey on a six-month quest to prove himself to the girl he must leave behind. It's November, and the floodwaters of the River Niger are beginning to recede. Here in the heart of West Africa, life revolves around the rhythm of the floods, and the stage is being set for the biggest event of the year. For centuries, this massive inland delta has played host to a peaceful and prosperous mix of people. Today, the town of Jafarabi in Mali bustles with farmers, traders, and fishermen of many cultures. And for one group of people, the air is thick with anticipation. The young men of the Fulani people are coming home. Each woman wants to look her best, so they use butter to condition their hair. and smooth their braids with flame. <laughs> Precious family heirlooms are painstakingly woven in, but the men may not return home for a week or more. And for 14-year-old Isa Bar, the time can't pass quickly enough. <laughs> He's also been gone a long time. Eight months ago, Isa watched her boyfriend leave the Delta and head into the brutally dry landscape beyond. For generations, Falani boys like 16-year-old Yero Sise have made this perilous journey, leaving girlfriends and family behind. And they've done it for one reason, to feed their cattle. For longer than anyone can remember, the Fulani have been cattle herders. Their wealth, pride, and identity are invested in their herds. Every year, the young men and their cattle make an epic and dangerous migration. So he found Hiro Jaka, find Andy Hollow Journey, for a chicken and a journey, Bengar Sakasi. Lara Bar, Pira Samiribira, so we chili him, and Yara. At the end of the dry season, the boys drive their cattle out of the lush Niger Delta and into the Sahel. Sahel is Arabic for shore, but this is the shore of a desert, not a sea. A scrubby, arid region along the edge of the Sahara 
that stretches 3,700 miles across Africa. It's the only place they can go. To the north are hemmed in by the Sahara Desert. To the south, by the deadly Setsi fly, carrier of sleeping sickness. Cattle are temperate animals. The success of the Fulani's ancestors has been their ability to adapt this animal to an arid environment. They've turned the Sahel into one of Africa's largest cattle herding zones, but at a price. Living mainly on milk, Yero and the other boys are away from home for up to eight months a year. <laughs> Bringing home a healthy herd is part of the traditional rites of passage for Fulani boys. And soon, Yero will be back home in Jafarabi, where his work will be judged. Isa hopes he's done well, with good reason. She's now old enough to get married. In Fulani society, parents choose marriage partners. If Yedo fails to bring his herd home in peak condition, Isis' parents are unlikely to consider him. Isis' cousin Dada is already married. She's seen it all before. Hairstyles may take days. Other adornments have been years in the making. As a married woman, Dada is allowed to wear the family jewels. Amber and gold have been traded along the delta for centuries, a mark of the region's prosperity. Yero and his herd of more than 150 cattle left the delta to avoid the annual flood and find pasture. But keeping his cattle fed in this bleak landscape is hardly Yero's only worry. Rebels and cattle rustlers roam the Sahel as well. Swarms of mosquitoes and ticks carry the threat of disease. From Jafarabi, Yero walked into Mauritania. He followed routes that may have been in existence for 4,000 years, when people and cattle were first forced into the Sahel as the Sahara dried out to become the desert we know today. After three months, Yero turned and is now heading home. Now, on the final leg of their trek, both the boys and their cattle are exhausted. Nightfall brings other threats, one in particular. Ah. 
young calves are especially vulnerable. S'il y a les lions dangereux, on ne dorme pas. On a fait un coup, ils ont peur. Il ne vient pas encore. Throughout the parched Sahel, hundreds of other young herders struggle to keep their animals alive. At shrinking water holes, squatters' rights prevail. to drive off a herd of elephants so their own animals can drink. killed every year by elephants in the Sahel. But today, these Goliaths appear in no mood for a fight. As many as 700 elephants migrate through the Sahel, some of the last truly wild herds in Africa. Just like the goats and cattle, they cover huge distances each year, driven by the same relentless thirst and hunger. That trek has left its evolutionary mark on these elephants. They have longer legs than their grassland counterparts, which they need to walk the 800 miles of their migration route, further than any other African elephant. As the dry season advances, the elephants converge on a rare source of permanent water, Lake Gassi. Elephants can drink more than 40 gallons a day, and here there's water enough for everyone. The elephants are allowed to drink unmolested, but they're hungry as well as thirsty, and that means trouble for the people who live around the lake. people have a proud tradition as nomads, but prolonged drought forced some to settle along the lake and try their hand at farming. They've made the Sahel bloom and in turn attracted a plague of giants. In the dry season, Omar Soadu has come to expect visitors. We are living here in this area just beside the water. Of course we use water for our garden and our, for our animals. But elephants, they come to drink water, of course, and they want to cool down their body. So all of us, we share the same water. During the day, an uneasy peace 
settles over the lake. People fill their goat skins, the elephants drink. But when night falls, the truce will be broken. After drinking, they come straight away to the garden because they smell uh, food, trees, and crops. So we have to protect our garden. It takes more than brush fences to keep out three tons of hungry pachyderm. If an elephant spends just half an hour in a garden, he will eat at least 30% of it. And this is the big danger for farmers. To lose a third of their crop is a catastrophe for any farmer, let alone here. And this is not your average garden pest. As the sun sets, the battle lines are drawn. The farmer digs holes to keep the elephant away from the farm, to not damage the farm, but it is not uh, enough. They come all the time, spoil a lot, of, a lot of things, and you cannot even get to sleep during the night. It becomes like an atma. Tonight, the nightmare materializes and the enemy is engaged. First light, Omar finds he's had a near brush with disaster. I discovered that there were two elephants in the garden. I followed the footprints to the next garden. I found out that uh, they damage a lot of uh, crop and trees. I do remember since I was a kid, we are doing the same things every year. And for sure, uh, we will do it in the future, every year. And this is the, the daily fight among us and elephant. Every time we are facing the same problem with elephant every year. And there's no end in sight. Throughout Africa, elephants and people do battle. Fences have done little to protect people from elephants and elephants from people. In the Sahel, it takes an act of nature to end this siege. Rainstorms are welling up from the south, and the elephants seem to know that lush vegetation lies that way. But in six months, they'll be back, and once again, Omar Soadu will not sleep. Three hundred miles to the west, the last days of Yedo's migration have come to resemble a forced march.
But today, they won't be killing any cattle. These are healthy calves, and they need to be branded. Putting his brand on the calves is a proud moment for Yeru. They're a tangible increase in his family's wealth, a testament to his courage and skill over the last eight months. Bolani cattle are rarely killed for meat, their dairy cows providing milk, butter, and cheese. Milk is a remarkably complete food source. It contains protein, carbohydrates, and fat, as well as vitamins and calcium. But it also contains lactose, a sugar that many adult Africans are unable to digest. The Fulani and other groups who have a long association with cattle have retained the ability to digest lactose past infancy, enabling them to benefit from their cattle turning grass into milk. In Jafarabi, the Fulani trade dairy products with other cultural groups. It is this willingness of different cultures to trade and cooperate that is key to the success of people in the Sahel. Tradition dictates that Fulani girls must buy presents for the returning boys. Isa has chosen kola nuts for Yeru. Rich in caffeine, they're chewed as a stimulant. They've long been traded and once served as a currency throughout the Delta and beyond. East of Jafarabi, the Jenna Mosque is said to be the largest freestanding mud structure in the world. Built in the 20th century, it's a powerful reminder of the Islamic influence here but it's a common misconception that Islam brought civilization when it arrived in the 12th century. There's new evidence that large, diverse cities were here more than 2,000 years ago. These centers of trade and cultural exchange were an African phenomenon. Yeddo may be just over the horizon, but until the floodwaters recede, it's not safe to cross. So Isa must wait just a little longer. As Yeru approaches home, he crosses land belonging to farmers, but far from objecting, they strike an ancient deal. A fresh supply of manure is always welcome. In return for fertilizing the fields, Yeru's cattle get free grazing on the stubble, another example of the kind of cooperation between different groups of people that's made life here possible. hundred miles east of Jafarabi is another example of cooperation. Tucked under the Bandiagara escarpment, 
are the homes and villages of the Dogon people. They've lived here since the 17th century, but no one is quite sure what attracted them to this place or why they stayed. Growing typical Sahelian crops like millet and sorghum, they appear to be ordinary farmers. But the lives of the Dogon revolve around more than just their crops. Local historian Achu Kasimbara explains. The premier of Vena is here. It was a small paradise for him. It was very, very agreeable. Il y avait des arbres et puis des lapins, des animaux sauvages et ainsi que de l'eau. L'eau coulait partout. Mais en plus de cela, il était venu trouver des, des choses dangereuses ici. Quoi. There's an unexpected serpent in this Eden. Crocodiles kill people in Africa every year. But in the Dogon village of Borku, crocodiles and humans have a unique understanding. How are you doing? Bon, Combata essaie de boucher du village, ainsi que Combata enlève des morceaux de viande pour donner aux crocodiles. Combata est aussi le village shaman. Il est un guide spirituel et un protecteur protector des crocodiles. Mais avec Pénadi, il m'a dit il m'a dit il m'a dit Mais nous avons la même Pénadi. These crocodiles are miles from the nearest river, and like the Dogon themselves, their presence is a mystery. On ne sait même pas à qui les a amenés. Pour nous, c'est le travail de guerre. Même nos anciens, nos anciens depuis l'an X, ils ont venu trouver les crocodiles ici. Perhaps God did put them here, or perhaps they're relics of a time more than 5,000 years ago, when the Sahel was crisscrossed by rivers. However, they got here, they found a sympathetic home with the Dogon. For the Dogon, every rock, plant, and animal a powerful spirit that must be respected. Kombatai looks after the crocodiles, and the crocodiles return the favor. Même dans le village, si il n'y a pas de pluie, si il fait la sécheresse pendant la pluie, donc il demande les bénédictions aux crocodiles. Plus tard, deux heures, trois heures du temps, ou bien dans la nuit, il y aura de la pluie. There's another mystery here. Around 40 crocodiles live in the village. Every year, during the mating season, amorous males signal their intent by blowing bubbles at the females. And every year, babies hatch from eggs laid on the bank. But the population never seems to grow. So, after they grow up, they quit here in the village to go to a very small marigot. We don't know if they go to the village or if they go to the village to go to the village. But the miracle of the Borku crocodiles may have a more mundane explanation. They may simply eat each other when their numbers grow too large for their pond. The 
Dogon's bond with nature influences every aspect of their life. The spiritual and the practical are one. In the village of Komakan, preparations are underway for a rare event, the village Dhamma. Dhammas can be held only after a good harvest, and in this environment, that doesn't happen very often. The Dhamma is more than a harvest celebration. It is the door to Dogon manhood. The Dhamma is also feared, as it can usher the old across the threshold of death. Before a Dhamma can take place, conditions must be just right. Sacrifices are needed to purify the village. To wear a mask and dance at a Dhamma is what every boy lives for. If there is no Dhamma, young men remain suspended between boyhood and manhood. Such is the case in the neighboring village of Torelli. Atomi Dogolo Sai is 29, but can't yet consider himself a man. Cela veut dire que quand on n'est pas initié, tu n'es pas un homme au complet. Donc tu es considéré un peu comme les femmes. Donc c'est nous le dama, c'est très important. For the moment, the closest Atomi will get to Adama is grinding the millet for the beer that will be drunk in the village of Kamakan at their celebration. Il n'y a pas de Dama à Terli. Pourquoi c'est mon grand-père qui organise le Dama et c'est lui qui fait tout. Alors lui, il a peur d'organiser et c'est pour ça qu'il n'y a pas de Dama à Terli. Atomi's grandfather is the oldest man in the village, the revered Keeper of the Masks. In the village meeting place, he holds court. It's his responsibility to determine the timing of the Dhamma. But there's a conflict. Some years ago, a spirit told the village fortune teller that the next Dhamma would herald the grandfather's death. Il risque de mourir, il ne veut pas faire le Dhamma. C'est un grand malheur pour nous. The last Dhamma in Torelli was 20 years ago. In Neymarin Komakan, the whirring song of the bull roarer announces that the day of initiation is here. Dama kana ga emin sego ba. Kira ba emin dama ga esi dia ba. Dama emin ana lugu yoji ga. Ina na be lugu yoji ga. Emin esi dia. Kija gara gara go ba. Kong go ngane emin ewi gin eba ina kana kui kana ba. Meanwhile, Atomy decides to act. He asks the fortune teller to contact the spirit that has condemned him to eternal childhood. The old man is the village shaman, and the spirit who predicts the future through him is the pale fox.
where did he know on the yard in the window? Now on Korotin, Korokana, we are in the Gia Munje. Only you, you Munje. In the power money on the show, pretty bigger. Bit in long between Dagani, me barter and Dagan. The final touch is a handful of ground nuts to tempt the spirit. Atomy may be disappointed. More than ever, the pale fox is becoming an elusive spirit. Foxes emerge in the cool of the night. Looks like Atomy may have his answer. Hello, Moka, Sabak. Et je vais avoir la bonne réponse. Ce que j'avais demandé au vieux, c'est ce qui me pose le problème. Oui, oui. Avant d'arriver, mon cœur se fait comme ça pour avoir très bonne réponse. Et maintenant, j'ai eu la réponse, je suis content. Back in Kamakan, the New Day heralds the start of the ceremony that Atomy can only dream of. Every household offers millet to thank the spirits. The old men of Komakan lead the dancing, showing the youngsters how it's done. Atomy may have the fox's blessing, but he still has to persuade his grandfather. Alors, je vais aller maintenant pour lui demander qu'il est temps de faire le don.
Dolgon society, authority comes with age. But Atomy is desperate, and he knows his quest will benefit all the young men in his village. Eventually, the old man relents even though it may seal his fate. Ce n'est pas cette année, mais c'est sûr qu'il y a des dames qui doivent venir, que je dois danser aussi. Avec ça, oh, je suis très content. Je suis très content d'avoir ça. This year, Atomy ground the millet for Adama. Next year, it might be him behind the mask. With home almost in sight, Yero is looking forward to some female company. On the edge of the Niger Delta, farmers are harvesting the rice. Traditionally, rice growers are marker people, but cultural boundaries are beginning to blur. These days, it's just as likely to be a Fulani gathering the harvest. Yeru's cattle graze the stubble, but not for long. The river is low enough to cross. Yeru can go home. On the far side of the river, boys and cattle from throughout the delta prepare for the crossing. 
there's one final test. Yero and the others must each catch their best cow and paint it. A few of the boys persuade some fishermen to take them across the river to see their loved ones. It's a homecoming for the cattle as well. One final push across the river, and everyone will be able to rest for a while. Yeru's cattle are his future, and he chooses to make the perilous crossing with them. Yero has triumphed in the Sahel. He's bringing home a healthy herd. It's something in which both he and Isa can take great pride. One day, Isa too hopes to wear the amber and gold of a married woman.
After the exuberance of the homecoming, Isa and Yero at last share a quiet moment together. <laughs> <laughs> Yero wants to start thinking about the future. Isa is pleased, but it's her parents who will have the final say. Yero has proved himself an able herder of cattle. And in a few more months, he'll have to prove it again. His future, and Isis as well, is tied to the rhythms of river and land, just as they've been for a thousand years on the shore of the desert, the Sahel. <laughs>